Yes, and we are live. Welcome to this uh, evening, afternoon, or early morning session uh, concerning the International Week and the International Days of the Honda University of Applied Science. And for this time, we have a special guest, Professor David Nichols uh, from New Zealand, Auckland, who is uh, joining us. And uh, he, well, probably people know him about critical physiotherapy, history physiotherapy, environmental physiotherapy, about his latest book, The End of Physiotherapy, which is not meaning about getting the end, but more of getting a new start and a fresh start in a critical way and see what we actually do, can do, will do in a way of becoming. Dave, welcome. Thank you, Joost, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you to, to Han University and um, just this opportunity to work together again. It's been, um, I think, a couple of years, right, about a year and a half since I was actually, since I was in the Netherlands with you and uh, had a lovely time with you and been working with you since. And it's really lovely to be able to um, zoom in from a very sunny, warm, um, midsummer. Um, Auckland, New Zealand. Sorry, if because I know a lot of you are in the middle of winter. Um, okay, now the session that I'm going to run today is about activity-based learning. And the reason why I think Joost asked me to talk about it is that I'm a physiotherapy by training and a lecturer in physiotherapy, but I, I teach across a lot of postgraduate courses at the university. And one of them in particular is called Health Professional Practice. And it's designed to get people who might be 5, 10, 15, 20 years after they've graduated back into thinking quite deeply about themselves as practitioners. So we all have to do reflective practice as part of our work. But often, in my experience, it's done in a very boring way. It's done in a very kind of dry way. But actually thinking about yourself thinking about your profession, thinking about the others that you work with, to me is one of the most interesting things we can do as professionals. So the, the idea that I had with the postgraduate course was to find a way to make that stuff interesting, to make it as interesting as learning anatomy or physiology or pathology or um, assessment and treatment skills. Now, I don't know whether it necessarily succeeds because we all love that stuff, but what I wanted to do today was maybe give you some insights into the methods that I use. Now, normally we would take days over this stuff and the students who do it, the postgrad students, have time to think about what they're doing and they actually do these activities for real in real time. But what I thought I would do today, because we've got quite a compressed amount of time, is show you some examples of activities and then kind of quickly whip through the way that I teach them and the reasons why I teach them and then leave it to you maybe afterwards to think about whether you want to actually do them for real yourself, which you'd be perfectly free to do. You're also perfectly free to take these and use these and adapt these. There's no copyrighted information here. You're free to use these as you wish. So the first thing I should say is you're going to need some paper and a pen. So if you haven't got those, I'll give you 30 seconds, go and dash and get some now. Okay, I think most people are back. Um, what you should be seeing on the screen now is the front uh, shot of a, of a keynote, a PowerPoint talk that I'm going to, I'll, I'll send to Yoast as well, so you can have the raw material here that you can see on the screen. Um, so you don't need to copy any of this down, but that's got my contact details on. Um, a little bit about myself first. Um, so as, uh, as Joost said, I work at AUT University, so Auckland University of Technology in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, I've been there for 20, just more than 20 years now, having emigrated from the UK. And the top corner is my, my family, uh, my son and my daughter. Um, 
then to the bottom picture in the center that's my front garden my lovely front garden where i spend a great deal of my time when i'm not um, working um, the critical physiotherapy network which is a group that i um, set up in 2014 to try and bring people together who were think, trying to think differently about physiotherapy the end of physiotherapy book um, which i just spent the summer um, in the act of trying to write the follow-up to that book called physiotherapy otherwise which hopefully will be out later in the year and then this bizarre picture in the bottom left hand corner is about my kind of fascination with physiotherapy history that's actually some traction being done on somebody and his feet are actually off the floor so you know some of the stuff we've done in physiotherapy in the past not only is it is it interesting in and of itself i think it's also quite important we understand our history if we're going to understand where we are as a profession and where we might be going and that's a big part of the work that i do okay so let me tell you then briefly about the approach to activity-based learning that I take. So I run this large semester long postgraduate course. It runs twice a year. It's multidisciplinary. We would have nurses, violence and trauma people, psychologists, OTs, physios, podiatrists, paramedics, a whole range of professions in the, in the, in the course. And its focus is on three things, getting these practitioners to think about themselves critically as professionals. So you, Dave, as a professional physio, your profession's culture, and then the various others that we all work with, be that patients and families, um, other health professionals, competing professionals, legislators, government departments, the whole range of others that we work with. So that's what the course is meant to get them to do. And that's really what they're assessed on. And we assess them using with six pieces, six artifacts, almost like art pieces that they create. And that's, that's submitted. And then they also submit a critical review. Now, one of the interesting, important things about the course is that we allow them to submit their work in any medium they want, it could be in written form. It could be in the form of a poem or a story. It could be something they make. I mean, that fan could be one of the things they submit. Um, they could submit a pen. They could make something. They can produce a piece of music. They can dance and video it. They can produce a photo essay. They're unlimited in the medium they can, media they can use. There's no preferred format for any of the work but we try to put the emphasis on them not writing. And this is crucial to how you think about the paper. Often as health professionals, we get very good at writing out what we think, but to try and get past things that are descriptive and to try and tap onto a kind of the metaphorical basis of how we think, the things that lie behind the obvious. Um, we try to get them not to write with their assessments. So they might hand that fan in as one of their activities, their six activities, and provide very little information about why that's one of their activities. Imagine going to an art gallery and you see a painting on the wall. Often it will have a little piece of writing by the side of it just to say who the artist is, what the title of the painting is, and basically when it was done and why it was done, but it would only be a hundred words. Well, that's pretty much as much as we want from them. The thing that they produce has to speak for itself. And some of the best pieces the students do are the ones that are really, really um, simple, but very deep and profound. And I can give you some examples of those later if you want. So less words, more kind of metaphorical art like pieces. And we've tried to remove all the normal rules about academic assignments. So there's there's no requirement that they have to write in beautiful English. We have a lot of students whose English is a second language and to insist on them having beautiful English and marking them down because of it is, is quite a kind of, it's almost a kind of xenophobic racist way of actually assessing people's ability. So as long as people can get their ideas across, I don't mind that the commas are in the wrong place and the spelling is all over the place. As long as I can understand it, that's what matters. There's no rules about how they reference. So there's no, they don't have to follow Vancouver or Chicago or APA method when they're referencing. They can reference any way they like, their own way if they want to, as long as I can find the material, that's all that matters. And there's no word limit. 
So we give them some guidelines. We say, for instance, with the critical review, that it wants to be about 2,000 words. But if they decide to record it and talk it because they're pre that's their preferred method, that's fine. They just estimate what 2,000 words would be. If they've got a script, they can count those up. And it's about five to 10 minutes. And so there's no, we try to take all of the pressure of the rules away and make everything about the ideas. Now I'm telling you this in quite an abbreviated way, as I say, because I think I'm, I'm hoping this is an approach you might think about applying yourself when you're working with other people. So I've said you'll need a pens and paper for the session. I thought I would take you through five of the activities that I actually do with the students to illustrate some of the things that we do in class to get them to think about themselves differently. Now, by all means, do these yourself as, as a play thing, but they usually take about half an hour to an hour to do each fully. We'll do this in a much um, shorter time span. So let's get started. OK, this is the first of the activities that we do with all of the students, and it's called Lifelines. So take your piece of paper and draw an axis on the page, just like you can see here. So a long vertical axis down the left hand side and a long horizontal axis through the middle. Now, the idea of a lifeline is that it's a visual way of telling a story. So what I want you to do is think about a moment in time, in maybe the recent time, when some things have happened in your life that are important to you. You don't need to write this or tell us, say anything about this. I'm not gonna ask you what it is. So this is just to keep for yourself. The time period could be 10 minutes. It could have been a critical incident on a ward with a patient. It could have been a day long series of events. It could have been a whole week. It could be a month. It could be the three years of your entire course of study. It could be the first 12 years of your life. It can be any period of time you decide. So just take a second to think about the first major event that you, you think of or time period that you want to draw on your timeline. And then what I want you to do is mark a line across the axis that goes up and down, tracking the course of the events. So start on the vertical axis, somewhere on the vertical axis, and then track a line up and down that marks the course of the events in your mind. Now, remember, I'm not going to ask you about the event, events at all. I might ask you to show me your line and hold it up to the camera, but that's all. OK, so draw it out now. I'll give you a minute or two just to sketch it quite quickly. Okay, so, and by all means, use the chat box as we're going through this, just if you've got any thoughts or questions or comments. So the thing to do now, and the thing we would do with the students is get them to look at this line and start to unpack it. So for instance, if you have a line that um, has many peaks on it, I'll just quickly sketch one. Let's say your line goes something like that. The first thing we would do is look at these peaks and highlight those peaks and just quickly document what those peaks represent. So just take a moment and just maybe write a note close to each of these peaks to say what it was, because a little bit later you'll forget what this line represented. So having some kind of record of what those peaks were, it will be quite useful. 
So just put a quick note to say what those peaks represented. Okay, now do the same thing for the troughs at the bottom. So highlight the troughs at the bottom and just make a quick note to say what it is that they represented as well, what was happening at that time. Okay. Now, the next thing we get the students to think about is patterns. So if you look at the high points on that graph, on your line, the first thing that you need to try and do is to try and see if there's any pattern going on in the points, those high points. Is there something that you were doing or something in the external environment that was recurring that meant that those things were high points for you. If you did this over time, you would see that high points often represent specific ways of thinking or specific series of events. So it might be that your high points are when people recognize the work that you're doing and acknowledge what you're doing. Or it might be that you are feeling particularly well. If you suffer with a lot of illness, for instance, those high points might be times when you're not feeling ill. Could be anything. Could be something internal to you or something external. But the point is to try and see if there are patterns. And of course, the more points there are and the longer the lifeline goes, the easier it is to discern those patterns. The same thing for the bottom, the dots at the bottom, the troughs, if you will. Look for patterns in those things. What makes those things consistently low points for you? It will be very idiosyncratic and unique to each of us. But what are those high, those high and low points for you? So the first thing to do is look for patterns. Now, I'm going to skip through this quite quickly. In class, I would give people a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes, just to think the stuff that they've got in front of them, does that tell them anything? but we, I'll leave you to do that afterwards. So patterns, first thing, high points and low points. The next thing to think about is the turning points. Now, in every graph that you've got here, you can see this, there's a point at the top here where things were going well for you. Things were rising, rising, rising to a good point, a high point, and then they turned downwards. Oh, I'm trying to do this in reverse. This is tricky. They turned downwards. So now instead of just looking at the points for patterns, look at the turning points. What happened to turn this from something that was rising and rising to something then that turned downwards? What happened? And again, this could be in your own mind. This could be a change of attitude that you had, something that had some doubt maybe that crept in or some sense of insecurity or some, some reaction on your part to something that happened. Or it could be external circumstances. Um, you got sacked from your job. Um, you got injured playing a game of football or something. And then everything had been going fine until this external event happened. So it could be internal, could be external. You don't need to judge. You don't need to decide good and bad here. You just need to try and work out what made that turning point for each turn. Now, the turning points that take you from... The turning points at the top of the graph are different to the turning points at the bottom, but you do the same thing there as well. What happened at those bottom points to turn things from going from a decline to a turning upwards? Can you again look for patterns? Can you identify what was going on, whether it was internal to you or whether it was ex external events? This plays on the idea of locus of control, the psychological idea of locus of control, which you probably know about. Uh, people have an internal or an external locus of control. Um, psychologists say, for instance, imagine you were going to meet a friend at the cinema. 
and in the olden days when people could meet their friends at cinemas. And you were going to meet them at nine o'clock tonight for a, for a film. And nine o'clock came and they weren't there. Ten past nine comes and they're not there. Do you think, oh, I'm, I'm an idiot, I got the time wrong, I must have got the time wrong. Or do you think, oh, they're an idiot, they must have got the time wrong. Now, a psychologist might say that that's the difference between an internal locus and an external locus. An internal locus, people go, oh, it's my fault. And I'm the one responsible for that course of events. An external locus, the person looks outside and says, oh, it's the other's fault. Now, that's relevant in rehab. That's a huge thing in rehab because, of course, if you've got a patient who has a strong internal locus of control, they won't listen to you telling them what to do. They'll only change their pattern and do their work if they turn themselves in their own mind to thinking differently. But if the person has an external locus, it's no good you trying to convince them to change their mind. You have to tell them what it is they need to do, and then they'll do it. So this point about, you know, these turning points on your lifelines are important because they can reveal something about your attitude. You know, if those turning points are all external events that change things for you, then perhaps you have an external locus of control and you look to external sources for guidance in your life. A lot of people who are very faith based have an external locus of control because they believe in a transcendental spirit of God as someone who guides the universe around which they exist. Often atheists have an internal locus of control because they believe that it's their destiny, it's their work that changes themselves. And you can see that in the reasons why you go up and down. Now, let's go back to this graph for a second because there's even more here. Let's not look at the points now, let's look at the slopes. Now, it won't be by accident that some of your slopes are almost vertical, either vertically up, a quick kind of rise, or a quick descent. And some of them will be almost horizontal, as if things happened very slowly. Now, you won't have realized this when you were drawing it, but that line actually does represent something here. So have a look at the slopes themselves and see, when I went from that point to that point, it was fast. Or from that point to that point, it was a slow process. Why? Can you identify any reasons why that might have happened for you? Okay, now I want you all to write something in the chat box now for me. And that is having spent a few minutes with this idea of a lifeline. Can you tell me what you think the lifeline itself actually represents? What is that lifeline, the up and down line mapping? What is it telling you about? Just jot down some ideas in your chat box. One of the ideas behind activity-based learning, if you, can design, if you can design these yourself for your colleagues and your students and friends, is that they have to operate a bit like a duck on the water. So there is a surface process that you go through. Hopefully, the easier the activity is, the better. And it looks quite superficial. But the actual work is like the duck's legs under the water, thrashing, kicking quite hard. There's actually quite a lot of depth to the ideas that if, if, they're, um, if they're good. Right, let's see. Let's see what we've got. Right, life energy, excellent. Um, possible narrative the last 10 years, way of feeling. Uh, how you might have changed things in your life. Um, yeah, thinking patterns, view on the environment. Thanks, Philip. For, oh, I haven't, I'll have a look at that in a second, your external locus. Um, a state of well-being and success, something your feelings and interpretations, um, visible feedback on mood and influences, state of mind, quality of life, optimism, state of well-being, 
um, pattern during the rehab process. Uh, looks like a lot and not very much. Excellent. In simple terms, what this lifeline represents is not an event itself. It's your emotional, your affect, your emotional response to that event. Two people standing parallel to each other going through the same life experience will draw a different line because it's how you respond to it. And so in that sense, the lifeline is not about the event so much, as in all good reflective practice, is not about the event itself. It's about what you, what it, the event meant for you. And so it's a cliche about there being no right answers here. So if, you are, if I'm asking the students to, to do this as part of their work, I, I'm not marking it on whether it's a good lifeline or whether it's an accurate representation of the facts of the event. I'm, I'm, I'm assessing it on the basis of how well they're able to use that to understand themselves better, to interrogate patterns of thinking, ways of reacting, the influence of the external environment on them, the things that make them feel happy, the things that make them sad, the things that give them a sense that it's me turning this around or I'm waiting for something to change. A sense of insight into knowing themselves better. Some people, um, every one of you, if you had the same lifeline, would interpret the lifeline differently because it's about your reaction to events. It's not about the events themselves. So the lifeline is probably something I would spend an hour, an hour and a half with the students working on. Um, and usually it's a pretty heavy start because they're thrown straight into this idea of really thinking quite deeply as 10, 15, 20 years experienced clinicians, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s often, they've never had to do this before in the context of the professional practice. Think about yourself as a professional. So then we go on to the next one, a bit of an amuse-bouche in the culinary terms, which is a bit, a bit of a, a laugh. It's quite short, but it's also quite powerful. So let's try this. Uh, let's try and get my mouse working. Okay, so don't write down or tell me the person that you are thinking of, but I want you to now think of a person you absolutely love. And just keep it in your head. Don't write it. Don't say it. No names. Now, this person could be alive. They could be dead. They could be a family member, a friend, a relative. They could be a fictional character. They could be a real person. It can be absolutely anyone, real or imagined. Have you all got somebody in your head? Yeah? Okay. What I want you to do then is write down on your piece of paper three things about them that you love. And if you're prepared to share any of them, just write a couple of the words that you've written down in the chat box, just so we can get a flavor of some of the things you've written. Only the ones you're happy to share though. And remember no names, no identification, just the words to describe what you love about them. Positive energy, oh, that's a lovely start. Kind, loyal, flexible, honest, humor, expectance of almost everything, acceptance, my apologies, CM. caring, spontaneous, passionate, optimistic, cute, lovely color, great story, trustworthy. These are lovely, really, really lovely. Okay, now let's do the opposite. Now I want you to think about somebody you absolutely hate. And I'm not just talking about, oh, I don't really like them very much. I'm talking about kind of Stalin-like hatred. Really, really detestable, loathsome person. Now, if you can't think of anybody, maybe just think of someone like Stalin. I mean, it's up to you, but there are definitely some people out there who are hate-filled. And I want you to conjure them up in your mind. Now, again, don't write down their name for me. Don't share their name. I don't want to know who it is. But write down three things about them that you absolutely hate.
And then if you're prepared to share some of these descriptions, stick a few of them in the chat box. Let's have a look. Toxic, dark, bad energy. Going to get some great descriptions coming up here. Cruel, dishonest, selfish, caring for nobody but themselves, arrogance, get blood under your skin, don't you get blood up from under your skin? Oh, selfish, cynical, condescending, arrogant, liar. This is fantastic. Okay. Now, this is a very quick thing to do. It's a very uh, egocentric, narcissistic, manipulative, hateful, selfish. What is What are these two lists actually representing? Can any of you think what they are? Maybe put them in the chat box if you can think about it. Some other things coming up here, selfish values, lying. What are these, t these, what are these words actually representing? Ideals? What? Uh, see what, whose ideals, our values, right, right, your own values, excellent, yes, right, now this is the key then, this is the concept of projection, have you heard of the phrase all feedback is projection, you ever heard this, all feedback is projection, in other words, when a person is giving you feedback, telling you off, giving you advice, whatever it is, they are actually telling you their own views and values they are not ever able to give you feedback in a sense that is truly you it comes always from them so what you get when you get feedback from somebody is a projection of what they think is important what you did here was to identify people who you would like to be thought of as being like and you would hate other people to think you were like so those projections of those two people and the words that you wrote are characteristics that matter for you, things that you aspire to and things you would hate to be associated with. So the particular choice of words is quite important because it tells you something about your values, um, about the kinds of uh, things that matter to you. And if you look at how you react to things in work, in your personal life, in your professional practice, if somebody pricks on some of those things, if particularly if those loathsome, hateful characteristics that you hate so much, if they associate you with any of those in whatever way, then that's going to be a problem. And that's going to get you at a, a real sort of emotional um, pitch. So this, um, this second activity about people we love and loathe is a very quick thing. But again, it's, it's getting people to think about this idea that when they give feedback to others, it's only ever coming from the perspective of those values that you hold. You cannot ever be objective and detached and value neutral when you're giving anybody feedback. You can't do it when you're talking to your patients. You can't do it when you're giving feedback to a colleague. You can't do it whenever you're getting, you're receiving feedback from somebody like a clinical supervisor or something who's telling you, I don't, I didn't like the way you did that. I think you should do this instead. What they're saying is, I think the stuff you did doesn't matter to me. This stuff matters to me. And I'd like to see you doing more of that, please. So it always comes from the person's perspective and understanding some of that through this kind of work can be really helpful in understanding yourself as a professional. Okay, let's do another one. I wrote an article a few years ago, which was about physio treatment beds. And the idea was to try and understand, well, to use a, a method to try and understand the everyday things in physiotherapy practice, the things we just take for granted. Now, my question to you is, why does a physiotherapy bed look like this? And I want you to do a little exercise for me. On your computers, go to your favorite um, image search tool, Google Images or Bing or whatever you wanna use, and type in the words treatment, uh, what shall we go with? Treatment, 
treatment room. Just type in those two words, treatment room. I'm just going to switch over to um, Go back. It's going to switch over to a different to an image search tool. I'll stop sharing for a second and then I'll share a different screen. So what I'm hoping that you are seeing is something like this. So hopefully what you're seeing is some pictures like this. Treatment room. Now, I don't know about you, but there is something about these rooms that, that, that seems to be quite luxurious. They seem to be about sort of spa-like therapies. The lighting is nice and soft often. There's, there's colored walls and painted walls. There's, it looks like, lux like it's quite luxurious and comfortable um, and very much about a sort of pleasure and enjoying the experience of being in that space. It looks quite expensive. Now then, type in the words physiotherapy treatment room. And look at the difference. Now, some of the things that I notice here, first of all, is the, um, there's a lot of white. The walls are white. Um, there's a lot of equipment. They look quite cluttered often. They look quite, as the phrase clinical would be the um, would be the words I would use. It doesn't look very friendly. It doesn't look like a place of luxury or or high value and high cost. It doesn't look like um, um, a nice space. It's as as Amber says, it's a bore. They're boring rooms. Now, there must then be something about the way that physios all over the world design their spaces. They must be trying to say something to the patient. So the paper that we wrote about, I wrote about a few years ago, was asking, well, if we took the most mundane example, let's say the treatment bed, which seems to be ubiquitous in all of these spaces, there's, in most of the spaces, there's a treatment bed. What is it that that says? What is it that that's, what is it trying to do? So let me just drop back to the previous keynote slide. Now, if you look at, um, I think these pictures will be familiar to you. Do you know that space, some of you? That is a um, physio treatment room at Han University and physio treatment student study rooms would look like that everywhere in the world, all over the place. There must be a reason why it's like that. So. Let's take the treatment bed for an example. Now, if you look at that one, any one on, on the screen there, quite obviously, the bed has to go up and down to, to account for different people's heights. You're working bending over the bed often, quite often. It has to have segments because the head needs to go up and you need to sometimes drop the legs down. And that makes sense. There's an ergonomics reason why the bed must look like that. But I think there's another reason. There's a bigger reason. And it goes back to the history of physiotherapy and our very, very early dispute around how we touched people legitimately. One of the first things that physio had to do as a profession to establish itself as a legitimate profession was prove that the young women who formed the early profession could put their hands on people, men and women, without being accused of, um, without being scandalous. Without, because there are so many associations between massage and pleasure and touch and sex and prostitution 
and people who just set up a massage clinic down the street but have no training, poor practice, anybody can do it. These early practitioners had to set themselves above that standard. And one of the most important ways they did that was to approach people's bodies in a very mechanistic way. That's why physio students learn so much anatomy and so much pathology and physiology and kinesiology and biomechanics. They learn about the physics of the body. Now, um, some of you looking in clinic rooms have got some of those anatomy charts behind you on the walls. I see Mika's got one. If you look in those pictures back in the, uh, on the Google search, you'll see that a lot of physio clinics have got charts of muscles on the wall. Now, I really hope that's not because the physios keep forgetting where the muscles are. Because it would be really terrible if you're treating a patient and you're going, okay, so that's your leg. So that's rectus, what's that one called? Rectus femoris, that's right. That's rectus femoris there, that is. It would be really bad. But that, of course, is not the reason why the posters are there. They're sometimes there to educate the patients. They're sometimes there to say to the patients, this is your rectus femoris muscle that's the problem here. This is how it works. It asserts our knowledge as experts over the patient. It allows us to socially distance ourselves from the patient. We are the expert, we are being paid, so we need to show that we are better, we know more, we are more powerful than you are. The poster reinforces that. But the bed reinforces something else as well. Imagine if you were a patient and you went to a private physio clinic. You'd never been there before. And you walk into the reception room and you're greeted by the physiotherapist who then shakes your hand and then opens the door onto their clinic. And in their clinic room, a small space, right in the middle of the room is a big double bed from home. Pillows, duvet, fluffy cushions, the whole lot. Big home double bed, right in the middle of the room. What kind of therapeutic experience would you feel you're going to get from that practitioner? It would look dodgy. It would look distinctly dodgy. So one of the ways that physios distance itself from prostitutes, poorly trained masseurs, any kind of sensuality or pleasure or luxury or anything that people might misinterpret is to design a bed and show you a bed in a clinic space where you can see all the machinery and the mechanical workings. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing under the duvet that you can't see. It's all visible, it's all transparent, it's all deliberate. So one of the things that we get the students in the health professional practice paper to do is to take photos of their workplace. Not fancy photos, not um, flashy photos of everything looking beautiful, but the sluice room where the bedpans are taken to be cleaned out. The corridors with the boring beige walls and the strip lighting. The, um, the doors and the curtains and things like that. I had a student a couple of years ago who was a Brazilian physiotherapist who worked in women's health. And we, she did a piece of work where she focused on the piece of equipment in her world that was the most important thing to her practice. And if I asked you to guess what it was, you probably wouldn't guess. It wasn't the bed. It wasn't a goniometer. It wasn't a particular uh, um, muscle strength testing device. It was her clinic door. And so she wrote this, she produced this whole piece about her clinic door, including the photograph of a very boring door. And it really mattered that the door had a lock and the door did not have a window because if she'd have been in a cubicle space with just curtains around it, it would have been almost impossible for her to do her work with these women. The work that she was doing on, on often pelvic floor pain required her to do quite intimate examinations and, and, and quite intimate work. These women needed to feel safe. They needed to feel secure. They needed to feel like they wouldn't be barged in on, that they could talk confidentially in a walled room, not a curtained room. And so the door becomes something that is without which she couldn't practice as a physio. So this activity is about trying to find the most mundane, boring thing in your working life that is essential to your work. Not the fancy stuff, the most mundane. Now I'd set you a challenge actually to think about this maybe over the weekend. What is the most boring yet essential thing in your working life? 
It could be a pen even. Now, the next thing that we do with the students and which is a bit cruel is we get them to bring those things in and then they have to leave them with us. They have to get rid of them. I mean, if you can, I mean, they can't take the door off the clinic, but where they can, they have to bring the things in and leave them. So we had a respiratory uh, physio with a stethoscope and she said, I could not do my job without this stethoscope. So we took it off her and made her work without it for a week. The point being that she would find other ways to do what she did. She would, she would learn new skills. She used her tactile senses. She used talking to patients. She listened to their breathing in different ways. We, she, she got so used to the stethoscope giving her immediate access to the information she needed. She'd effectively shut off all the other ways she could find out about the patient. So I went around um, the physio department when I was there 18 months ago and I took some photos and uh, this is the kind of things the students might submit, just a photo essay like this. Without commentary, I think that picture on the left with the, that was, I didn't make that picture up. That is actually as it was, the head on top of a cupboard, sliced in half, I think is beautiful. You could make a book cover out of that. Um, it's, it's, to me, that's a piece of art. I mean, if you wanted, you wanted to have an image of what a physio, of what physio thinks it is, that would be it. A, a decapitated head on top of a cupboard. That would, for me, be how I think a lot of people think about physio. And the image on the right is, is nursing, obviously. And here you've got no person, of course. There's no person here. This is an arm. And one of the things that is so important and interesting about this is that a lot of our anatomy learning, if you look in a lot of the anatomy textbooks, if you're studying the hamstring muscles, the hamstring muscle of that person could be any person, could be any hamstring muscle. The idea is that you can apply that learning to anybody as if everybody was the same. That limb says that could be any limb. You can stick in, in it's in, putting a needle in someone's vein could be any vein, they all look the same. Well, of course, that's also a white limb. That also says something about the kinds of things that you're gonna see. I think it also looks like, a, it's certainly an adult limb. I don't know whether you'd see it was gendered particularly, but they've probably worked hard to not make it gendered. But the implication with a lot of our anatomy learning is that it's one size fits all, and it depersonalizes us from real people which of course is part of the ethic of physiotherapy. You can't be too close to the person because if you're too close and they become personalized, then there's a risk of the sensuality of what we do coming back in. And then you can't then differentiate us from the quacks and the prostitutes and the massage parlors. So a lot of this stuff about physio treatment beds and the way that they look is deliberately designed, although almost unconsciously, to portray a certain particular image about what physiotherapy is. Okay, let's move on to number four. I've got two more to do. This is quite a quick one. So here are four types of coffee. You've got Nescafe Classico, seems like an oxymoron on that, but that's what it is, the top left-hand corner. The top right-hand corner is an espresso type thing. The bottom left hand corner is a drip fed filter coffee and then there's a kind of artisanal hand poured coffee in the bottom right hand corner. You have to decide for yourself which brand represents your idea of the future of physiotherapy. If physiotherapy were a kind of coffee, one of those four kinds of coffee, which one would it be? And then I'll get you to write your answer in the chat box. Not, not just yet. Don't write it yet. If you have, don't worry. But don't write it. I want you to write it all at the same time so that you can't see other people's answers. And then I'm going to ask you in the chat box again to give me a reason why you picked that one. So have you decided? Are you ready? Okay. And write your answer. The artsy one. Bottom right, bottom right, handmade coffee, bottom left, filter coffee, bottom left, bottom right, bottom right, Nescafe, the arts one. Okay. So we've got a lot of people who went for the bottom right. Let's start with that one then. So this is the hand poured one. 
maybe just write a sentence about what that says to you about physiotherapy then, future physiotherapy. Those of you who picked that one, why did it capture your imagination? Why did it speak to you about physio? Because it's different every time with every person. That's nice. Personality, handmade, unique, your own handmade. Connected to the environment, earthy colours in the background. Filtered. Attention, personalised, organic art, unique, fresh, handmade. Renews with every cup. Lovely. Okay, thank you. Those people who went for the bottom left, interactional. Oh, Karen Barad getting in there, Yoast. Um, um, those who went for the bottom left, uh, could you say why you went for that one, why that spoke to you? I don't think anybody went for the Nespresso one. Anybody on the from the bottom left? Simple, transparent, no fancy tricks. <laughs> if it's shit coffee, you can't hide from it. No pretense. Hmm. Leave the bag behind and fill with coffee. Okay, good stuff. Yeah. Elegant. Okay, cool. Um could anybody speak up for the uh the uh, I can't remember the name of it. The one on the top right. Uh, taking time, just reading these comments. Two people, two people see the benefits of equipment. Ah, oh, but also the beauty of human and human contact. Lovely. Um, what's it called? The one on the right, the top right. The oh, George Clooney advertises it. Nespresso. Nespresso. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. What Thank else? you. Nespresso. Right, the Nespresso one. Has anybody put a good case for Nespresso? This is Nespresso Physio. Okay, and last but by no means least, the Nescafe Classico version of Physio. What, what made people go that? So Nescafe, as a physio, you'll just be part of a patient's story and have to, do, uh, have to dose it together. My mum loves it. <laughs> Good enough reason to design an entire profession around Philip's mom's taste in coffee. That'd do for me. Okay. Again, here you've got one of these situations where you take something everyday and mundane and you're trying like the duck on the water to see, to draw, glean something deeper from it. This is just a simple visual metaphor, but it speaks to four different kinds of ideals. I've done this with students for a long, long time, and we always get differences of opinion. And probably most people could be satisfied with their profession sitting in either because they all have some value. Some people who go for the Nescafe Classico talk about it in terms of a kind of democratic politics, that if healthcare could be like that, then it would be affordable to everyone, it would be cheap, and it would be available to everyone close to where they live, it would be accessible which is obviously a big thing for marginalised communities. But then people in the bottom right talk about the artisanal nature of it, the fact that healthcare can feel special and different and particular to them and bespoke. Um, there's arguments for both. The point is to try and design ways in which you can tease apart differences, but apply them in a, in a, a relatively simple way. All right, so let's go on to the last one. You need a piece of paper for this and it needs to be landscape and you need to draw on it those lines. So there are eight lines, horizontal lines down the left, then four, then two, then one. Okay, now turn your page over 
So you're going to write on the back. And as fast as you can, don't think about this at all. Write down eight words, single words, that your best friend would use to describe you as a person. Don't think, don't be modest, just write them down. You're not going to share them. How many again? Eight. Okay, five more seconds. You've got to do it quickly so that you don't think too much. Okay, now if you look at the chat box, I want you to number them in this order from top to bottom. So write the numbers by the sides of the eight words in this order. Five, two, four, eight, six, one, three, seven. So you should have eight words that describe you and eight numbers by the sides of them in a seemingly random order. Philip, you look perplexed. You all right? Sorry, you you just mentioned, listed a few numbers, but th those were more than eight. Well, I'm confused. About, so oh, I'm just any, any no. kind of, did, did I get something wrong there? Look at the numbers in the chat box. Number oh, no. your eight. Okay. No, sorry. Oh, good. Sorry. Okay. okay. Now, the reason for random randomizing the numbers, and the number order could be anything you like, is because you will have gone to certain things as a priority and then other things as maybe not. And I wanted to mix them up. Right. So what I want you to do now is transfer the words in their correct number order onto the left-hand side of that sheet. So whichever one was number one, goes at the top, underneath that goes number two and three and four and so on. So you mix them up. Okay, now the fun bit. This is why it's called the World Cup of Values activity, because these have to compete with each other. So if you, if you take your top two, for instance, you have to decide which one wins and goes through to the next round. So it goes across to the second column. Only one of the two can win. You have to decide which one wins out of the contest between those two concepts. And do the same for all eight until you've got four remaining words in the second column. Um, that are more important or are more you, you can decide, Stella. You decide. You just have to decide what wins. Not your best friend's uh, opinion anymore. Yours, like our Words. own. Yeah, your, your decision. And again, try to do this quite quickly and quite intuitively. And then the logic follows through. Do the same thing for the third round when you get to the actual final. Which two go through out of the four that you picked and then which one wins overall? What you've created here 
is what's called a values hierarchy. Now, if you turn the page on its end, so it's portrait, and actually it is pyramidal shaped, that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a hierarchy of values. Now, although I asked you to think about what your friend would say, of course, all feedback is projection. So what you thought a friend would say isn't what your friend would say, it's what you hoped your friend would say. So these eight values are actually really what you really want people to think about has been important to you. You then have to, by, by playing a game with this, and this is another aspect of activities, it's safe play. You create a situation where people can play with serious stuff like what really matters to them, but in a playful way where you just have to choose. Out of those two, this one has to win. Now, in life, those things never happen. But to get to the point where a person goes, I choose that over that, you have to kind of make it, you have to gamify it a little bit, make it trivial and silly. So hence why we do it as like a World Cup game. And there's many other ways you can do it, but you're trying to tease apart what matters in a way that doesn't matter. So you have this values hierarchy, and if you turn it so that the, the finished one is at the top, that's one of those things that right now really matters to you. Now, it might be something, the things at the top, probably the eight things that made it onto this chart are things that will endure for you. They matter, they have mattered probably for a long time. But sometimes they can shift and they can change in their order. And a week from now, you might have, the contest might have played out differently. But the point is that values hierarchy matters. Those of you who've been in long-term relationships or any relationships, family, for instance, but this is also true of colleagues and patients, you each carry with you a values hierarchy. And there's, um, there's an idea that the stuff at the bottom of the pyramid um, this is stuff that we're happy to interchange. We, we're happy to share with people. It's, it's like, you know, whether, which football team you like and whether you like cabbage or not. And it's just nobody cares. You, you're not going to get into a big argument about your love of celery. It's just going to be something that you're just going to be able to talk about in the pub when you haven't met somebody for six months. But the higher up the values hierarchy you go, the more careful you have to be. Many, many relationships break down because the things at the top of this person's values hierarchy are not respected by the other person. If you get into an argument at a, at a, at a bar or with some friends at a party about the stuff that's at the top of their values hierarchy, you're going to lose a friend, particularly if you critique it or you undermine it. It's the same for our patients. It's the same for all of us. It's the same for our colleagues. The biggest issue in disputes is often that people attack the things at the top of the values hierarchy. So when you, when you have an interaction with people, often you have these kind of walking world cups of values going on. And often one of the hardest things to do with a, with a client, I think, is to try and work out what sits at the top of their values hierarchy. And just to make sure you, you, you walk very, very lightly around that. But you need to know yours too. You need to know your pressure points, because if you go back to your lifeline, the thing we did at the start, I bet you there's a correlation between the things that you said are important values for you and the things why that accounted for some of these peaks and troughs, the high points and the low points. There'll be a correspondence between the two. And the better that you get at doing this kind of work, the more sophisticated that becomes, the more, the more sensitive you get to seeing these things cropping up over and over again. Okay, I wanted to leave us some plenty of time for a bit of a conversation. Hopefully not through chat, we can actually do this with the mics open. I think we've got about another 20 minutes, Joost, is that okay? Yes, that's completely, yes. We so um, those were some of the kind of examples I wanted to show you of activities we would spend a long time in a classroom with, with postgrad people, and there'd be lots of discussion afterwards, and it would unfold. And as I say, I'm more than happy for you to take these, play with them, do them yourself. One of the things about these activities is they often don't work as well the second time. So if you know that you're doing this with the World Cup of Values in this way, you're kind of anticipating you're going to be choosing. So you don't put that one next to that one because you want that one to win. It doesn't work as well. So there's a degree of naivety that's needed here. You're having to keep reinventing ways of doing it, but doing it in a playful way, doing it in a way that's sort of safe is one of the best ways you can get people to think deeply about themselves as professionals and their profession's culture and the others that they work with. So I hope that's been useful to you.
Okay, so Joost, do you have any questions or thoughts or comments? Well, first of all, David, I think this is wonderful to go through it. Uh, well, my first thought was um, we've been in action from eight o'clock this morning with uh, meetings, with uh, a lot of people, conversations wow. mostly. Now going back to it and going, so this was really the perfect time to go back and dive into oneself. I definitely want to say that this, um, this for me was a marvelous experience, how, how to look upon values, what it is, uh, what kind of interactions. Uh, there are. Oh, we got a question if we can stop screen sharing. Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to get there now. Yeah, there we are all together. Uh, I think that this, what to me, what, what you just showed uh, is a kind of a different example of looking upon ourselves as healthcare professionals, as persons, as humans. There are different angles and kind of a variational perspective into yourself and not only the self, but also the other, or don't know what even other means in this sense. Uh, well, I have to I have to think. Some of you, how, do you have an idea? Who likes to to tell something? Yes, Laura. I fa I found this really useful. Thank you very much. It's it's something that I think we use a lot in psychologically informed practices as well. But I think mm. what what was really interesting is this idea of sharing our professional sort of ideologies and how we've come to this place as clinicians and what our mm. internal motivations and attitudes might be bringing to our professional identity um so i found that it's always a really interesting moment for reflection because i think sometimes what happens when we move into physiotherapy practice we haven't had a lot of time to actually think well what do i bring into the room how do i how have i got here what has happened and shifted within myself so i thought that was a really interesting activity so thank you very much for sharing it just yeah i wonder what it's like what difference do you see in the students once they've been through this or in the in what yeah what what shifts do you think when they do practices like these thanks laura um i mean yeah two there's two sort of answers to the question the first one was about the the act of psychologically informed practice i spent three years with a team of um, psychotherapy lecturers managing a team of psychotherapy lecturers at the university and was amazed at the different way that they have a curriculum their curriculum we we in physiotherapy i think vastly emphasize technique skill learning knowledge truths facts information but we spend very little time interrogating our own motivations and our own beliefs and values and yet we're all individuals we're all different people we come at it with different aspirations and dreams and goals psychotherapy is the complete opposite there's not that much technique to be learned um, but they spend for every hour they spend with a the client they will spend 10 to 20 hours thinking about what the implications of that experience were and that's how they learn they learn through that relational dialogic process of well what are you so they will talk a lot about transference and counter-transference. Um, they're sitting with a client who's talking about maybe serious childhood abuse. And then the immediate period afterwards, their supervisor is saying, well, I noticed your reactions when she talked about such and such. Have you explored your feelings about her comments, both as a person, but also? And of course, when we're dealing with patients, chronic pain, chronic illness, chronic functional problems, fear of dying, the kind of stuff that we deal with is heavy stuff. And yet we're never really asked to explore our own experiences of that. Maybe we had relatives who died at a very young age and it's a scar on us. And yet we don't, we don't explore it. We don't see it as part of the therapeutic process. So I think there's some work to be done in the physiotherapy curriculum to reorientate maybe away from so much heavy skills learning and much more in terms of understanding ourselves as people and practitioners. Not that it, we become psychotherapists, I don't mean that. And I don't wanna demean the technical side. I just think that the balance, the pendulum is very far to one side in physiotherapy. 
Um, you asked the question about how, whether it, what effect it has. Um, bearing in mind that we would have people who might be between, say, five and, in some cases, 35 years in practice. Some people come without really realising until the first few days uh, adrift in their profession, really, really unsure about whether they want to carry on being an OT or a midwife or a physio. And it's been sitting there for ages and they didn't think the paper was going to get into that with them, but it forces them to acknowledge the fact that, look, I'm just lost. I just don't like my job anymore. And I've had people go both two ways. I've had people go, uh, last semester, I had somebody who was a midwife, 30 years a midwife, rediscovered her passion for midwifery because she started digging into all the things she loved about midwifery and realized that it's, you know, she'd lost her way, but actually it was still what she really loved. And I had a, an OT and a podiatrist uh, last semester who go, you know, it's just, I've lost interest in it. But the actual process of coming to that realization was very therapeutic for them because they weren't treading water anymore. They weren't just going through the motions every day, feeling like they were underselling their work to their patients, feeling like they were being poor professional colleagues. They just had to decide. Um, so that's the more mature end of the practitioners. The new practitioners often, they come at the point when they've got to grips with the technical side of practice, in practice. So you know, after you graduate, you often feel very green and the first two years, you don't know what you're doing. And, You've got a lot to learn, even though you've just done all your study. They settle and then they start thinking about what, what's next. And if you can get them at that stage, when they start doing the long weekend courses and doing all the you know, heavy technical stuff, if you can get them at that stage, then that's really fantastic because then they start to really go into those things, reflecting on why. What, do I really want to do that course on acupuncture or do I actually want to uh, do something else? Um, do I want to actually go and become a pain counsellor or a specialist in hydrotherapy or work with animals or something? So for, I would say, about a third of the students, it's quite a um, confronting, uh, but also some some cases quite transformational experience. And then for the other two thirds, it's um, another postgrad paper that they do and they enjoy it. It's very popular paper. They really like the freedom to be expressive, um, to not have the normal boundaries around assignments and 5,000 word written essays and things like that. They love that. And some of the things they produce are, are astonishing. I mean, really, really amazing. Um, yeah. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. So one of the upcoming colleagues here, what do you think about this uh, that you just went through? Um, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think um, it's a really nice way of looking at um, uh, values and um, a way of uh, dealing with with things in in life, and I think it's uh, you can use it in in patients. For mm. example, the the um, the lifeline um, mm. to really highlight where uh, a patient where a patient feelings come are coming from, um, mm. uh, and use that in their rehabilitation. Uh, but I think you can also use it uh, for students um, when they uh, maybe even on their first day, if they uh, the, write down their values in the, the hierarchy, mm -hmm. the pyramid, um, what they think visual therapy uh, means to them um, mm -hmm. and then see what, what happens and then do it uh, after they they. Uh, they've learned a, a bit more and a bit more technical side of it. Uh, see if that changes, and um, maybe see if if the technical side how how important that is, or maybe it isn't important, or it isn't important. Um, uh, I think the I trick think, Peter, yeah. is to find some way you can get to the stuff that matters. Yeah. Because if you said to a student, let's say you'd gone on your first placement and your supervisor on the first day said, tell me what matters to you. Mm -hmm. 
it's so intimidating everything's so intimidating you not you couldn't even access what matters to you right now what matters to you right now is to get through the next 10 minutes without wetting yourself you know i mean it's like that's like basic human level performance stuff right now so don't ask me about deep stuff so to get to the deep stuff is quite difficult and i think we do a lot of work in physiotherapy because we don't explore this stuff to make students actually wall it off to hide it away, to not be exposed. You're not supposed to look vulnerable. You're not supposed to have doubts about your practice. You're not supposed to question particularly. These are the facts, these are the truth, this is what you do. So to get to actually, well, no, I don't so much like that. I think this is better and I wanna try that with somebody and I don't really feel that way about this, is very tough for a student to do. So you've got to get some mechanism to do it which is why play therapy and sandbox therapy and stuff works give somebody a couple of you know stick figures little cartoon figures and say tell me about those what do those things represent and suddenly you've got a way around the barriers that they've got in place because it's all fiction it's all about these silly figures it's not about me really and of course it's all about you so a lot of the activities are um tricks to break down the kind of tension of it's me and you to actually, it's not me and you, it's one doll and another doll, or it's a, a car and a train, or it's different kinds of coffee, or it's a World Cup game, or it, it's just tricks to kind of break down the barriers we put in place around each other. And I think you're absolutely right. You can do that definitely with patients. And it's particularly important when you've got very limited time with people. So if you can find some ways with, with your patients to actually create a silly, fictional kind of play-like environment, you can get to some very powerful stuff with them. Why is it that you're not doing your exercises when you get home? Why is it you're still having that pain? Why is it you're so frightened of getting breathless on the treadmill? You can't ask the person that, but you could play that. You could play that out with them in some way. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hanneke, Samantha. Yeah, yeah. I was just uh, thinking the same as Thera was saying. Um, you were talking about postgraduates, uh, five years, thirty years into practice. Um, mm -hmm. But doing those exercises, I think um, they're really important. In what Sarah said for the students as well to. Um, connect to the values that connect you to physiotherapy um, mm -hmm. before you start your practice to, mm -hmm. um, to really understand why, why, why am I doing this and why am I treating this patient this way? Um, so I think we can do more of that. Yeah. And you're not doing uh, physiotherapy by accident either. <laughs> There's no accident here. You got here for a reason. Some of those reasons are within your control. Some of them are accidental. They're serendipitous. But if you can understand why you're here, um, and that's a complex thing, it will help you a lot to know where you're going to go. Yeah, sorry, and I think it's, oh, sorry. Yeah, I think it's really important to connect to uh, the reasons why why you're there. And um, I think for um, for all students, it's important to think about that before you you mm. graduate. Yeah, and what I really like is the almost playfulness of the um, kind of exercises we did. Mm -hmm. And you're really creating something on paper. And for patients, I think that could be the first step in creating something in their own process. If they never created something and just take a pen and paper and write something down, they already created this first step in mm -hmm in a change and it's a really nice thing i take out of this workshop here mm. thanks samantha the thing i was just wondering um some of us has been had experiences as working in the in hospitals working with uh covid19 patients and that kind of things and also being introduced with different kind of therapists around this mm. um 
we have a strong value base and that's the thing that's us as physiotherapists of us as a person that you think for example uh you some of us will put caring for the other one highest on top of everything well maybe other ones will put knowledge highest on their value of things the moment you understand that then you can also understand maybe a little bit more the difference between people um so i think it's nice to look upon others but also upon yourself to see where can possible tensions figure out because you will you will see them or within students within classes that some of you are extremely passionate and you sometimes believe that everybody is as passionate as you are mm. not even think of it that you think oh maybe they are passionate about something else so i know some of you are extremely passionate about uh working together being together caring for each other and sometimes it's hard to see that somebody can be more consumer like uh, in the thing that you are passionate about and can be passionate sometimes about something else, which is, it's a tension, but that tension can be more make, uh, visual in this place. So that's what I, I really like. Mm. Thanks, Jos. We've got about, I think, just a couple of minutes left. Um, Dave, anybody... I want to I want to thank you for your wonderful uh, presentation uh, tonight for us. Perhaps uh, I don't know the time in New Zealand. It's afternoon. It's the it's in the morning. What time is it? Half past eight in the morning. Yeah, in the morning. <laughs> um, again, thanks for your, for your wonderful uh, presentation. I, um, it was very inspiring, and it um, it, it, it and the lines that the relevance of these issues uh, related to uh, often uh, implicit uh, beliefs and and, mm -hmm. and attitudes mm -hmm. relevant for becoming a physiotherapist. I, and you reach it uh, tools to 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 start a conversation about these uh, issues. Excellent. Very inspiring. Thank, thank you very much. And Joost, uh, you thank you for bringing um, bringing David in. Thank you, Herman. Uh, thank you. It is, it's always a pleasure here to, to, to be with everybody and uh, to work with Dave and with the rest of us. Dave, you. I was just going to suggest if some of these things appeal to you, have a look at the work of what are called breaching experiments by uh, the sociologist Garfinkel, Irving Garfinkel. Breaching experiments were things that he did with his students in the 1960s and 70s where he was interested in the way that people just have conventional ways of going about things that they don't question. And so he trained his students to uh, do everything that was counterintuitive. So to take people's conversations absolutely literally, um, for instance. And so he'd get the students to talk to their friends, their family, and anytime somebody used a cliche or something, they just took it literally. And it, it caused fights because people thought they were being mocked, that they were being made fun of. Um, they, they did all kinds of things like uh, they went to restaurants and they ate with their hands. They um, went, went into the cinema and stood up the whole time. Um, and just anything that was meant to disrupt the norm and to disrupt the taken for granted and obvious. Um, so you can apply these in very minor ways or very grand ways in your practice. It's a bit like identifying a stethoscope as being vital to you and then losing it, taking it away, hiding it in a drawer so that you're forced to A, value the stethoscope even more when you get it back, but also to recognise that there are alternatives. There are other, always other ways to think. And that kind of notion of, first of all, find out what you do as routine and obvious undermine it and then open up the possibilities to difference and then try to bring the thing back and have everything is a really, really great way to do things. But if you do go to the cinema and stand up and you get beaten up, it wasn't my fault. Garfinkel's breaching experiments, well worth looking into. They're very funny. Thanks, Joost. Thanks, everybody. It's been really lovely to see you all again. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Thank you, Dave. This was Thank really you. amazing. So uh, let's give a warm applause for Dave and uh, have a nice day, Dave. Mm -hmm. Yeah.